All right, so let's talk about where things go wrong and what can be done. So kidneys, you know, they're super important. They're hanging there. They're protected by the ribs. Uh, there's two of them. You can lose one and you're still pretty much okay. Uh, that would be a traumatic issue or a congenital issue. But then there are global things that happen where both kidneys go down. And you start to run into problems when your glomerular filtration rate drops below about half of normal. And what that is called is uremia. And basically, it's, it's everything. I mean, if, if your kidneys are failing, everything is failing. And so the symptoms of uremia, they are very broad and diffuse, but, but often fatal. So you'll have, uh, you can think about each of these and what the underlying organ system that's failing uh, uh, might be. You've got fatigue, you've got nausea and vomiting, you've got uh, anorexia, not eating well, malnutrition, weight loss, uh, breathlessness, like difficulty breathing or, or sense of uh, not getting enough sleep. Pain, you can get arthralgia, joint pain or bone pain. Uh, you can get uh, pericarditis, inflammation of the lining of the heart. Uh, long term, particularly in uh, uh, kids, you get growth retardation uh, and, and fatal. None of you probably know this uh, sitcom, but this was a guy who was a, a, a pretty famous child actor, but he was extremely short. He had a, a, a kidney problem, and so he had a growth uh, retardation due to chronic uh, uremia early on. Different strokes. Anybody ever heard of that? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Offense? Okay. Thank you. All right. So, what do you do? Someone's got uremia. Everything is failing. You've got osmotic pressure, you've got pH imbalance, you've got buildup of nitrogenous waste products, uh, urea, creatinine, and so on. So, what well, you could do dialysis. And this you know, amazingly, uh, a very simple thing, um, but it works pretty well. It's time consuming. Uh, the way people most know about it and the way it's still And you basically have someone who's in chronic kidney failure come in a few hours, depending on how bad their kidney failure is, they'll come in more, even multiple times a week. They'll basically just sit in a recliner, and their blood will be taken out, flow through a dialyzer, and there's a dialysis membrane in there where there's uh, ion balance of the correct type uh, that's compatible with ongoing life, uh, and then the blood is sent uh, past that dialysis membrane, and uh, as it passes through the machine, there's a dialysis adjustment of water and ions running down their uh, concentration of gradients, and uh, loss of some of the waste products, the creatinine and, and uh, while, of course, the membrane is set up to retain, much like the earlier uh, fenestrations, it's set up to retain cells and, and proteins. And then the filtered blood is sent right back into the body, okay? So it's, it's not very efficient. You have to sit there for a long time, but it gets the job done and keeps people alive and people can stay on hemodialysis for many years. Uh, there are slightly more convenient versions of this. Uh, there's something uh, called peritoneal dialysis um, where you can actually, people can be, uh, can go on while someone's walking around. And basically what you do is you capitalize on the uh, peritoneal lining, which is this high surface area, fairly well vascularized uh, abdominal uh, vasculature and, and interstitial fluid. And you can basically introduce into someone's peritoneum, straight into their, their, their belly, uh, a large quantity of dialysis fluid. And the peritoneum will act as your own dialysis membrane. And you can walk around and dialysis will happen. And then you'll take it out uh, after uh, some uh, days even. And you just Basically, the advantage of this is you don't have to be sitting in a chair while all this is going on. And that uh, works. Uh, it's not quite as good for uh, severe cases. 
So, um, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, hemodialysis, you have to go to the hospital to get this done. You know, you lose all the, all the transport and travel issues. Um, you know, we do know that it works well. There's a lot of experience with it. You can survive for a long time with it. Uh, this is a big issue, though, access. So it's not as simple as just putting in, you know, a, a port and taking out the blood. It's actually a little complicated. You want things to move efficiently, so you want a high pressure outflow coming into your dialysis machine, but you don't want to take the blood supply of some, you know, part of the body. You don't want to put that at risk, and so you've got this tension. You want an artery type pressure, but you don't want to steal the blood from something. And so what what is usually done is a, uh, called a fistula is created, which is a uh, unnatural connection directly between an artery and a vein. Normally, of course, you go through capillaries and then you come back to the vein. A fistula, this can happen spontaneously. It can be a you know, malformation. Uh, that's how a lot of people end up with uh, hemorrhages in their brain, for example, or spontaneous EV. But uh, this is a surgically created fistula in this case. You actually directly root uh, part of an artery into a vein. And so then you take this high pressure uh, venous uh, outflow, and that's how you create your interface. With the dialysis. Um, so, you, so that's the theory. It works pretty well. You, you can't do it right away. First, you have the surgery, then you have to wait for a while. Due to the higher flow and pressure, actually, the venous uh, wall adapts and it becomes a little tougher, and that's sort of the maturation process of the thing. Um, there are uh, synthetic approaches. A venous graft, and for various reasons, some people a fistula is not practical, small veins, or other reasons, and you can end up actually uh, building the interface between the artery and vein with a synthetic tube or graft. And so the advantage of that is you don't have to wait for the vein to build its uh, stronger wall. You can use it in its placement, and what you're accessing is right through this uh, synthetic tube, and so you can retrieve it. There is. Some risk, increased risk of clotting and infection. It's an artificial thing. It's the body's not well set up to deal with it, and so you can have uh, clots. You can also um, have uh, a catheter-based system. This uh, venous catheter, for example, you basically thread in something directly into the uh, vasculature, and there's uh, two chambers: catheter for two-way flow of uh, blood. Uh, you, this you can do right away, so no need for surgery, no fistula, no graft. Uh, uh, it's, you can do very quick, temporary uh, hemodialysis by this. Uh, Want to stick with it for various reasons? You can uh, keep the catheter more or less tunneled or fixed in place, uh, but you, it's, it's pretty good for a short-term uh, emergency. Like with any artificial element that's introduced, you have a risk of clotting uh, and infection. So the dialysis fluid, this is what it looks like. You basically have the healthy concentrations of sodium, potassium, calcium, and bicarb, and uh, zero waste products, so they run down their concentration gradients and so on. Um, and, you know, the basic system is, is pretty simple. There's feedback control uh, uh, to detect pressure changes, a little bit of heparin, which is an anti-clotting factor to keep the blood from clotting while it's going through the vessel. The actual membrane, you know, it's a, it's like a cellulose membrane. Those of you who have done lab work and done dialysis, you know, it's pretty simple. It's like, um, uh, it achieves the molecular weight uh, cutoff that the uh, sibling Pretty simple dialysis. Uh, peritoneal dialysis, this is where you introduce the fluid directly into the peritoneum. The principle of the body is its own dialysis machine in this case. Peritoneal lining is the dialysis machine. Okay, so mnemonics, or mnemonic, I guess in this case. This is a uh, ways to think about the uh, indications for dialysis. Uh, if things get really bad, uh, A, E, I, O, U, gets uh, acidotic, acidosis. 
uh, electrolyte abnormalities, particularly hyperkalemia, too high potassium. That's extremely dangerous. Um, why is high potassium so dangerous? Again? Don't have any action potential. That's right. Why exactly? Yeah, the neurons. Right. So neurons, and actually more acutely, uh, heart. That's probably what will kill you first, is your heart instead of the, the neurons. But you, you're, you're exactly right. In any case, anything firing action potential, uh, if it can't repolarize, it's uh, you're in trouble, and your heart will go into depolarization and depolarization. Hyperkalemia, extremely dangerous. Um, uh, you know, clearing out toxins, um, people who overdose on aspirin or lithium. Uh, fluid overload, just as dangerous for the reasons we talked about. Big fluid shifts cause changes in brain uh, volume, and if you have fluid going into brain cells, the brain expands, and even a little bit of expansion can be fatal. There's all kinds of sharp edges in the uh, skull. Uh, you can cut uh, in a fatal fashion your pons and your brain stem just with a little bit of brain expansion. So a little bit of fluid overload and, uh, can be very rapidly fatal. And patients not responding to diuretics, things that are pro-urination. Then you can get very serious uremia symptoms, heart inflammation, cephalopathy, which is dysfunction of the brain, uh, cases. 